Okay. Uh, welcome to the second talk of uh, today's uh, uh, International Christian University Linguistic Colloquium. We have Dr. Mark Baker uh, presenting his talk, and Dr. Michael Berry from Southern University will introduce uh, Dr. Baker. Okay. Thank you very much, Sohun. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Mark Baker. Uh, he's a distinguished professor at Rutgers University, um, having graduated uh, from MIT. And, um, and I keep finding out that more and more linguists started off life as mathematicians, and Mark Baker is another one. Um, uh, after spending 10 years at McGill, he's now at Rutgers. Of course, we all know him uh, for monographs on incorporation and the polysynthesis parameter, um, on agreement and on case. Um, he's also written um, um, uh, a more uh, popular accessible book, The Atoms of Language, which I'm sure you all know. And in his uh, other life, um, uh, uh, researching uh, soul, the, uh, the nature of the soul, he also has published a monograph there on uh, the soul hypothesis worked on numerous languages. Uh, we, of course, we all know him for Iroquoian and Bantu, but has also worked on Amharic and uh, Turk, Saka in particular, a Turkic language, published in NLLT, LI, Behavior and Brain Science Syntax, Canadian Journal of Linguistics, presented at uh, numerous conferences, LSA, Waffle, Fazl, Wickful, Nels, um, and, uh, and um, uh, uh, of course, for me, um, my own work uh, was on Iroquoian, and so that's how I uh, first got uh, acquainted with Mark Baker academically, and then finally in person. I think um, uh, was in Singapore was the uh, first time we maybe saw each other in person. Um, anyways, uh, that's Mark Baker. Um, so um, why don't you um, uh, begin? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Michael, um, for the introduction, and um, thanks for inviting me. Now I can add and uh, International Christian University in Tokyo to the list. Um, let me share my screen. Oh, yeah, somebody else. Okay, somebody else stopped. Good. And I think I need to do this in two stages for optimal results. So might take a moment. So. I do that, and then I do this, and then I plug in my second screen, and then I can move your faces out of the way so that you don't block it. Uh, how does that look? It looks good. Yeah. All right. So um, my topic today will be on logophoric pronouns in African languages. I want to talk about some universal features that they have and some variations as well. I'm always interested in the um, looking at exotic things in other languages, exotic in scare quotes, um, and, um, and seeing how they're different and how they're um, the same. Um, the topic of logophoric pronouns is it's a classic um, topic in the syntax of West African languages. It's one of the things that um, these languages are best known for uh, um, in a broader kind of perspective. Um, and the definition is um, that some languages have a special pronoun that's used in complement clauses to refer to the matrix subject. So if you say um, Okon told his mother the news, you can only use the normal pronoun his to refer to the subject Okon. You can't use this special one um, that I'll be talking about it because it isn't in an embedded clause. Um, but then if you have an embedded clause, Okon told Edem that MM doesn't like him. Now the pronoun is in this embedded clause um, and it is possible. It can refer to the matrix subject, although not to the matrix object. Um, if you want to have a pronoun that refers to the matrix object, then you use the plain pronoun, not the special logophoric pronoun. So a special pronoun in complement clauses only, whose job is to refer to the matrix subject. Um, that's the topic that um, will be under investigation here. Now, some languages have a special pronoun that's used in complement clauses. Oh, this is the same thing. This is just another language, Edo. Um, from Nigeria, um, 
if you use a plain pronoun in the embedded clause, it can't refer to the matrix subject. Rather, you use the special marked pronoun, the logophoric pronoun, to refer to the matrix subject. And that special pronoun can't be used in an ordinary matrix clause. Not in C2 anyway. There's a little bit of a qualification for that in Edo that it is okay if you focus. It. So it's some kind of strong focused form, um, but that strong focused form becomes a logophoric pronoun um, in these embedded clauses. And um, just to compare, these logophoric pronouns in West African languages have uh, both similarities and differences to long distance reflexives in languages like Japanese. So put that out in front of there um, here. Um, so if you use uh, the pronoun jibun in an embedded clause in Japanese, like the detective told the politician that gangsters were searching for jibun, well, that can refer to the um, matrix subject, but not the matrix object, just like the special logophoric pronoun in, um, in the African languages. What's crucially different from the, about it is that this can also be used in matrix clauses as an ordinary reflexive. So this is similar to the logophoric phenomenon in West Africa, but this is um, quite different. Um, when we define logophoric pronouns fairly narrowly as I do, then it becomes clear it's, it's an aerial phenomenon. All the languages are um, clustered that are known to have it are clustered in this kind of area um, of, um, of West Africa. Um, and to the extent that there are um, languages elsewhere, I mean, maybe there's one or two sporadic examples um, that are contested, but it's, it's, it's the strongly um, aerial phenomenon, which is part of what makes it interesting. Then, um, my analytical framework for approaching that in this talk will um, be as sketched here. Um, what I'll assume is that um, the the embedded complement clause has its head complementizer, um, and that licenses a special null determiner phrase, an operator in the syntactic sense, um, which exists here. Um, and then um, the relationship between the matrix subject and the um, um, logophoric pronoun isn't a direct one, um, but it's, it's brokered, um, mediated by um, this op here. Um, so this doesn't um, bind this directly, but this one um, enters into a control relationship with this one. Um, and then this one binds this one. So you're a logophoric pronoun only if you're bound by this kind of operator and subjects can control it, but objects can't, something roughly like that. And there's a long tradition of this going back to Koopman and Sportish's study of Abe uh, back in the late 1980s. So it's a, it's a familiar kind of framework in the business. Um, why should we believe such a framework that there's something um, going on in the near the complementizer position here? Because we don't see any noun phrase there, but you know we all believe in lots of things that we can't see, radio waves and so on. Um, um, well, one bit of reason for thinking that something crucial is happening in the complementizer phrase um, is the fact that it um, makes a big difference whether you're above the complementizer phrase or below it. Um, so kind of repeating examples that I already mentioned, if you're a pronoun that's outside the complementizer phrase and you want to refer to the matrix subject, it has to be the plain one. It can't be the special logophoric one. Um, but if you are inside the scope of the complementizer, inside the embedded clause, then that reverses. Um, then the logophoric pronoun is a natural way to refer to the uh, main clause subject. Uh, whether the plain pronoun is um, also possible or not varies from language to language um, in a way that I will return to. So that's a bit of evidence that something crucial is happening in, the, in or near the complementizer position. Another in, um, initial motivation for this kind of analysis comes from the fact that pronouns behave differently depending on what complementizer you have. So the examples that I've shown so far have this complementizer K. Oh, all these examples are in the Abibio language um, of the Cross River region of Nigeria until I mention explicitly other languages. 
Um, so this is from the ABBO language. Um, so the normal um, finite declarative complementizer is K and logophoric pronouns are possible under that complementizer. Uh, but in some cases, um, um, the sentence seems very similar, but a different complementizer glossable is Sia. Not Ocon is ashamed that he stole a book, but Ocon is ashamed because he stole the book. Um, not a big semantic difference on the surface there, uh, but under this complementizer, you can't have the logophoric pronoun. Um, you can only have the plain pronoun. Similarly, Ocon does not see that his mother is guilty under the complementizer that you can have the logophoric pronoun to refer to the matrix subject. But under the different complementizer how, um, you can't have the logophoric pronoun. You can only have the plain pronoun in something like Ocon saw MM stealing his goat. So that again shows something crucial is happening in the complementizer position, in particular with the complementizer K, but not Sia or Nanya. Um, so again, that said, some complementizers are doing something special. The idea is they're the ones that are hosting this operator uh, position. Um, and um, this operator position, whether that's there or not, uh, makes all the difference in the world for whether that can be there or not. Now, if that's the right analytical framework for looking at these kind of uh, logophoric constructions, um, then there are three subtopics to develop. Um, we could develop um, which complementizers can license that sort of operator. Well, I already hinted at that, that that matters. Um, we can look at uh, what can control that operator. So we can look at this relationship. Why does the subject control, but not the object? Um, and we can look at this relationship too, the relationship of binding between the operator um, and the special pronoun, what restrictions apply to that. And for this talk today, I'll talk briefly about this. I already did basically. I'll talk briefly about this one. Um, and then I'll spend the, um, a little bit longer talking about this third one, um, the restrictions on this relationship, because that's where I think we see the most interesting pattern of universals and variation. Um, so then looking at these different components of the construction, according to my analysis, the first component is, do you have an operator there along with the complementizer head? So where can these operators occur and what kind of phrases? And the rough answer across the African languages that I've looked at is that they can definitely appear in full finite um, complement um, CPs that have a verbal complementizer. So that clauses, the equivalent of that clauses do host these in all the relevant languages. And we contrast that with a nominalized constituents. So not um, that his mother did something wrong, but rather his mother's fault, where fault is a nominalized um, version of this verb. Now it's a nominal construction rather than a clausal construction. And inside the nominal construction, the special logophoric pronoun is out. Um, only the plain pronoun is um, possible. So that's the, the universal um, borders of this phenomenon. Um, good with full finite declarative CPs, bad with nominalized constituents. Um, and I think we need to do more research on what about the in-between cases, nominal CPs, infinitives, gerunds, things like that. Um, in fact, most of these do allow logophoric pronouns in a BBO2, um, but I'm not sure how robust that is cross-linguistically yet. So that's component one. What kind of structure needs to be there in order to allow this null um, um, pronoun, null operator thingy? Um, and the answer is you need a CP structure with a particular kind of C. The next question is what can control that operator? What's the relationship between the arguments in the main clause um, and that operator in the specifier of CP? What restrictions are there? Well, this one I'm going to touch on only briefly again. A rough answer is that it's thematic subjects that can do it. And there's two parts to the expression thematic subjects. There's thematic and then there's subjects. 
This slide is illustrating the thematic part, which is that the thematic roles uh, matter. Um, so with verbs like tell and ask, we saw that the agentive subject can be the antecedent of the logophoric pronoun in something like M.M. asked Ocon if Adam saw him. Him can be M.M., but him can't be Ocon. Um, so um, that's a possible controller of the operator. That is not. Uh, but we can compare ask with heard, heard from. Um, Ocon heard from M.M. that Adam doesn't like him. Um, here, the structure is the same, similar anyway, um, with um, subjects and um, oblique objects. Uh, but in this case, the oblique object can be an antecedent for the logophoric pronoun. Um, Ocon heard from M.M. that Adam doesn't like him. Him can be M.M. as well as Ocon. So there's a difference between a source phrase and a goal phrase. In other words, the thematic role matters. The controller must have a certain kind of subject-like thematic role. It has to be an agent, a source, or an experiencer. So that, um, I think, nails down the relevance of thematic role. Um, but the uh, notion of grammatical subject also plays a role here. Um, so you can see the subject part when you have two noun phrases, both of which have the right kind of thematic role to control the operator, then it matters which one's the subject. And subjects of active sentences are always possible controllers of the um, operator that binds logophoric pronouns. So the most elegant um, demonstration of this in the Abibio language um, is um, the verb um, toyo. Um, it can be used with only two arguments, a subject and a clause, and then it means remember. Same verb can be used in a transitive causativized version, um, then it we translate it in English as remind. So the children reminded Ocon. Now, if you have only the person who's reminded here, um, that is an experiencer. That's thematically eligible. That can control the operator that binds the logophoric pronoun. So this is possible. Um, however, if you have, in addition to Ocon and remember, you also have the agentive subject in the children reminded Ocon, um, then the logophoric pronoun can't refer to the experiencer anymore. It can only refer to the agent. Why? That's a possible thematic role, um, but this one's the subject and that trumps it. Um, so thematic subjects are controllers. It matters what theta role they have and what the subject is. Uh, um, and that's, um, I've got a lot of data to show that in um, Ibibio. I've got a little data to show that in Yorba. Um, it's consistent with what we know about Awe from the literature, um, but I don't really know how, um, how that works out uh, further cross-linguistically. As far as I know, there's little variation there. That's a relatively universal aspect of the construction. Um, I can put a little aside here, since this is an African colloquium. We can ask whether this operator that's uh, involved in logophoric constructions is the same thing that complementizers agree with in a language like Lubukusu. Um, so this is another thing that African languages are famous for. Um, they're famous for um, having complementizers that can agree with something in the matrix clause. Um, Lubukusu is studied by Michael Dierks, who I think has been another of your colloquium speakers, um, is one of the best studied cases of this. So Alfred told the people that they would win, um, and this complementizer can agree with the matrix subject, ah, uh, ah. Uh. Um, it cannot agree with the matrix object, that's ba, but Bali here wouldn't be possible. Well, if we look at this, that's a similar pattern. Um, we saw that the matrix subject can bind the logo for, but the matrix object can't in a BBO. And we saw that the matrix subject can um, be agreed with uh, trigger agreement on the complementizer, but the matrix object can't. That would all fit into a nice tidy little bundle um, if um, Lubuk. Kusu and Ibibio both had the same operator here. It's controlled in the same way by the matrix subject, but not by the matrix object. And then Lubukusu agrees with it. And um, Ibibio has special pronouns that can be bound by it, but it's the same 
underlying kind of structure. Um, the problem is that that turns out to not be true. It turns out that um, those things don't go together so tightly. And a BBO is the crucial um, language to prove it. This is why I reconnected with um, a former student of mine who's a native speaker of a BBO, because a BBO is like the one language that we know of in the world that has both the phenomenon of complementizer agreement and the phenomenon of logophoric pronouns in the same language. Um, and here we see that the two don't necessarily go together. I showed you before that the logophoric pronoun can be anteceded by the, the from phrase of a here verb. Um, but the agreeing complementizer can't be. So this pro logophoric pronoun can be bound by MM, but the agreeing complementizer can't agree with MM. You can have an agreeing complementizer, but it has to be agreeing with the matrix subject. So we really have to say there are two of these operators here. One's controlled by the matrix subject, one's controlled by the matrix source. The source one binds the logophore and the, um, um, the agent um, uh, binds the one that um, is agreed with. So um, two operators, not just one from a broader African perspective. Well, that was a little digression um, off the main line, um, but if you wanted a little East Africa, that was your chance. Um, now for the rest of the talk, I wanna focus on the third um, crucial um, relationship here. Um, we've, um, I talked a little bit about the operator being licensed by particular complementizers. I talked a bit about the conditions under which an argument of the matrix clause can control that operator. For the rest of the talk, we drill down on this relationship, the relationship between the operator and the special pronoun that it binds. And the hypothesis is logophoric pronouns have to be bound by that kind of operator. Now we can ask, what are the restrictions on that um, operator binding? And the first impression is that there are almost no restrictions. Um, it seems like the logophoric pronoun can be in any um, role in the embedded clause. It can be the subject, it can be the object, it can be the indirect object, it can be a possessor. It can be even um, more deeply embedded. So Ocom thinks that Adam told me that phone respects him. That logophoric pronoun can refer all the way up to the um, subject two clauses up. Um, it's even possible in side an island of the kind that Jason was telling you about. So um, here's a relative clause. Ocom thinks that Adam is looking for a woman who will marry him, that him is the logophoric pronoun and it can refer to the subject outside the relative clause, outside the complex noun phrase, outside the complement clause, um, all the way up here. So this does not seem like it's a movement-like relationship and it's not subject to the kinds of locality um, that we often um, see um, that kind of operator variable relationship being subject to, although not in Jason's language, um, as he showed us in detail. So the restriction between the operator and the pronoun, the logophoric pronoun that it binds seems relatively unconstrained. Um, however, there are some restrictions that appear in a particular case when one tries to have two different pronouns inside a clause that are both referring to the antecedent. So here's the one place where you find some interesting restrictions. Ocon thinks that his son insulted him, two hymns in the embedded clause, one of them a plain pronoun, one of them a logophoric pronoun. In this case, that's relatively okay. It's slightly dispreferred. Um, speakers prefer to have two logophoric pronouns. That's a little clearer and less ambiguous but they don't really mind this one either. Uh, but that contrasts fairly sharply with this one. Ocon thinks that he insulted his mother, different embedded sentence, uh, two pronouns again, um, make this one a logophoric pronoun and this one a plain pronoun. Now it's totally impossible um, for this to refer to um, Ocon um, as that one does. So when you have two um, mismatched pronouns in the embedded clause, sometimes that's pretty uh, acceptable. Other times it's completely out. Um, what's the difference there? 
Well, in order to talk about the difference here, um, I'm going to need to use the relationship of C command. And here's a little primer on C command. I don't think Jason defined this for me, um, although it was present in some of his examples. So we talk about um, one thing, C commands another thing. If the first category, the first phrase that contains the C commander also contains the C commandee. And this is a, a, it's a formal definition defined over syntactic tree structures. And this is crucial to understand the behavior of pronouns in many languages. For example, in English, the antecedent of each other must see command it. So you can have the children saw each other's mothers, um, but not the children's mother saw each other, not each other's mothers saw the children not each other saw the children's mothers. So why is this one okay and the others are all bad? Because this is the only one where each other is C commanded by its antecedent. Here are the kind of structures. This is the one that was okay. Children saw each other's mothers. First phrase that contains children is the sentence as a whole and that also contains each other. So we're good. But in all of these others, if you look at the first, the first phrase that contains the children here is the NP and that doesn't contain each other. Here it's the NP and that doesn't contain each other. Here it's the verb phrase and that doesn't contain each other. So we use C command to talk about the fact that only this one is possible. Very familiar um, um, syntactic notion if you've survived even one syntax class probably. Of the um, now, why did I um, review that with you? Well, that's what we need to understand where the mixed pronouns are possible in um, the BBO language. So the generalization is that mixed pronouns are possible if neither one C commands the other, um, and they're bad if one C commands the other. So in these kind of constructions, this one C commands that one, so that one's going to be bad in a BBO. This one C commands that one, that one's going to be bad in a BBO. But here, neither one C commands the other. Those are going to be good in the BBO. Um, and here are the BBO examples. Ocon thinks that his son insulted Log. Pretty OK. Ocon thinks that he insulted mo Log's mother. Bad. Ocon thinks that Log's mother insulted, Log insulted his mother, plain pronoun, also bad. Um, Ocon thinks that I will give Log's mother his book. That one's relatively OK. Um, so it's the ones where one pronoun C commands the other that are ruled out in this language. Um, now, here's the big surprise that's unfolded for me over the decades um, as um, I've worked on more and more lang African languages over the years. There's surprising variation in this respect. Four languages have been described in these terms and they show four different patterns. C command is almost always relevant, but it's relevant in different ways in the different languages. I said the originators of my framework were Koopman and Sportiche 1989 in Abe. And in that language, it's always bad for a plain pronoun and a logo for to refer to the same thing. C command doesn't matter. But in all the languages I've been directly involved in with myself, it does. So in the Edo language that I worked on in the 90s, um, it's bad for a plain pronoun to co-refer with a logo for unless the logo for C commands the pronoun. There's one C command um, possibility that makes the co-reference possible. Yorba, um, as uh, analyzed by um, my student um, Shea Adesola, um, is a different rule also relevant to C command. Um, there, it's bad for a pronoun and a logophore to co refer only if the pronoun C commands the logophore. Um, so usually it's possible, but if the pronoun C commands the logophore, it's out. And then a BBO, which I'm working on currently, has this uh, fourth pattern that I already reviewed. Um, it's bad if either one C commands the other. So there's a lot of variation here. C commands always relevant, but in different ways in different languages. Now, what I want to show you is, in fact, I think this is not as chaotic as it might look. Um, there is at least one important universal plus one or two parametric choices. Um, what 
wasn't obvious in the way I stated it before is um, there's this one case when the plain pronoun C commands the log of four, and that's bad across all of these languages. Um, in contrast, you look at where the log of four um, C commands the pronoun, that's okay in two and bad in two others. Or there's the case where neither one C commands in um, the other, that's also okay in two of them and bad in two others, a different two. So these factors are cross-cutting, they're, they're um, independent factors. So we've got a universal here, just like my um, title advertised, um, and we've got some variation here also advertised in my title. So let's see if we can um, um, tease that apart a little bit and learn something from that. Um, so first, the universal part which I think is the most important part because I'm a big fan of universal grammar. Um, the plain pronoun C commands the log of four, this is bad in all. He saw log's dog, bad in Abe. Ozo wants that he find money, money log, bad in Edo. Um, Olu wants that he find money log, bad in Yorba, and similarly in a BBO. Why is that one universally out? Um, well, my claim is that this taps into something deep about language. It's got two parts. One is the question of what logophores, in, logophores intrinsically are. I've been calling them pronouns, and they are in a certain sense. But the claim is that semantically, they're really bound variables. Um, and then once we make that assumption, then there are deep principles about how pronouns relate to bound variables, the so-called strong crossover effect. Jason talked about that too. Um, so that's a unifying thread for today, strong crossover. I could talk about weak crossover too, but I won't until the question period if you make me. Um, so let's take the two steps then. First is logophores. Logophores are intrinsically bound variables, whereas pronouns are referring expressions. At least they may be, they're, they're canonically referring expressions. Well, this is a difference. Logic gives us the idea of bound variables where uh, pronoun is actually, it's a subtle difference in some cases, but it's an important difference. And it can be brought out um, by using quantifiers. Um, quantifiers can bind variables, um, but there aren't referential expressions, so pronouns can't refer to them automatically anyway. Um, so now these sentences are different from the ones that I showed you before um, in that the matrix subject is the quantified noun phrase, nobody. Nobody thinks that Ocon hates him. Is that possible with the logo for being bound by nobody? And the answer for the logo for it is, but for the plain pronoun, it's degraded. And for the plain pronoun, it's totally out if the, there's a logo for there even if it doesn't see command it. So the claim is that um, the, the pronoun is a referential expression. So having a non-referential antecedent throws it off. But the logo for is a bound variable. Um, so it's fine with having a quantified expression that binds it. Um, another classic way of um, investigating this, Jason mentioned this too. Um, is the idea of sloppy identity readings. Um, these are particular readings you get in ellipsis sentences um, um, when um, to show whether you have a bound variable or a referential pronoun. So here we're looking at a sentence like, Ocon said that he will come to the party and MM did too. Well, what did MM say? Did he say that Ocon will come to the party? just like Ocon did? Or did he say that he himself, Emin, will come to the party? The first one is the so-called strict reading. The second one is the so-called sloppy reading. In English, it's ambiguous between the two. But English is a poor, impoverished language that only has one kind of pronoun. Um, the crucial thing here is that, um, um, that Abibio has these two. And there is a difference in these sloppy interpretations. Um, if you use the logo for, um, then the elided sentence means MM said that MM will come to the party, the sloppy reading, um, where um, this is interpreted as a variable bound by something. 
On the other hand, if you use the plain pronoun, that prefers to get a referential reading where we're referring to some other person and both Ocon and MM are talking about that same other person. So this one is referential. This one is a bound variable, just like we saw with the quantified antecedents. So that was step one. Logophores are bound variables, whereas um, um, pronouns are, um, are, are um, natively referential expressions. Um, step two is um, a universal principle about how pronouns and variables relate. This is the strong crossover condition. Again, Jason mentioned it. Um, I'll just use a very simple version um, where it's bad to have a variable bound by an operator um, if a pronoun is in between the two, where the pronoun C commands the variable. Um, so variables like to be bound by operators, but not if there's a pronoun um, structurally in between the two. This is something we see with quantifiers and interrogative phrases. Um, so everyone likes his mother. Um, that means all X, X likes his mother. Um, and then we can ask, can this pronoun also be an instance of that variable bound by the quantifier? Um, and in this case, it can because the pronoun doesn't come between the two structurally. But in this case, it can't. He loves everyone's mother. Um, everyone, um, that can be for all X. He loves X's mother. That's fine, quantifier and variable. Um, but here the pronoun can't be um, an instance of the same variable. It has to refer to somebody else. So this can't mean for all X, X loves X's mother, um, the same meaning that we had in this case. That's out here, whereas it was possible here. And same thing with interrogative phrases. Um, uh, for which X, X bought a picture of him, him can be X. But for which X, he bought a picture of X, he can't be X. That's the crossover configuration um, where the pronoun got in the way. Why am I talking about all of this? Well, because that's what I, that's the universal thing that we see with um, logophores too. Um, so this is the same data repeated, but the claim is that operator that I talked about semantically, it's, um, it's a Lambda operator in this case. Um, and the logophoric pronoun is its natural variable. It's an intrinsic variable bound by that um, lambda operator. That's the semantics that we have for the structure that I gave you. And then the question is, can a pronoun be also be that bound by that variable? Can the pronoun take on its reference from the variable? And the answer is maybe yes. If the pronoun doesn't see command the variable, just like with quantifiers, just like with interrogative phrases, but definitely no if the pronoun does see command the variable. That's a strong crossover violation with operator pronoun variable, the configuration that um, strong crossover rules out. So um, this is bad in all of the African languages that I've studied because it's tapping into this deep principle about variables versus pronouns um, and how they relate to each other in the crossover phenomenon. Um, the last thing to talk about here, um, and I guess I should be finishing up, so I will um, um, do this quickly, um, is what about the variation part? What about the other configurations? Um, for example, when the logophore C commands the plain pronoun in Ozo wants logophore read book his. Two of the languages allow it, two don't. How can we talk about that? Well, my hypothesis is that this is a more superficial phenomenon. It has simply to do with the fact that pronouns need to match their antecedents and grammatical features across languages. Um, so in general, um, we say um, here um, in English, you say John thinks that he saw her mother. 
he and her can't be co-referent. Why not? Because they don't match in features. This one's masculine, this one's feminine. Since they don't match, they can't co-refer. Now, my hypothesis is that some languages take a, a plus logophore feature and they grammaticalize it into a phi feature. They make it the same kind of feature that we have in the case of gender. Um, and if the language does that, then the logophore has a feature plus L, the pronoun has a feature minus L, those clash just like those clash, um, and the configuration will be ruled out in the language. In other languages, uh, there's still logophores and plain pronouns, but it's not a, a grammaticalized phi feature in the same sense. Um, then, the, then this one could take this one as an antecedent. Then they don't um, have the feature mismatch. So the hypothesis is the variation in the pronoun being bound by the logophore has to do with the fact that the pronouns should match their antecedents in grammatical features. And plus log is a grammatical feature in some languages, but not in all. I think there's nice converging evidence for that in the BBO language. Uh, BBO is one of the languages where um, the logophore clashes with the plain pronoun. Um, so this is a language in which that is treated as a phi feature, as a feature on a par with third person and singular. Um, and here we see that confirmed by the fact that the logophoric pronoun and the plain pronoun treat, trigger different agreements on the verb. Um, so these are different for agreeing with the verb, therefore they're different from agreeing with each other, therefore one can't have the other as an antecedent in this kind of language although it is tolerated in another kind of language. Um, the last bit of the talk then is, uh, there's another version of that. What about the case where they um, don't see command each other? Again, that's possible in two of the languages, not possible in the other two languages. Um, and this relates to something simpler. Um, this relates to a difference you see in the languages, even if there aren't two pronouns in the embedded clause. If, there's a, if it's a logophoric construction with the right kind of complementizer, but there's only a plain pronoun there. Um, well, so Ocon said that Ima likes him, always possible with a logophoric pronoun. Is it possible with a plain pronoun? Yes, in a BBO, yes, in Yoruba. Uh, but not in Edo in Abe. And my claim is that that's another case of feature matching. Uh, but here it's not feature, ma it's feature matching between the pronoun and the operator, not between the pronoun and the logophore. So just like we said that logophores are sometimes marked plus log, sometimes not, we can also say that operators are sometimes marked plus log, um, sometimes not. Um, in these languages anyway, I think the pronoun is always non-logophoric. Um, but uh, sometimes the logophore is, um, uh, conflicts with it, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes the logophoric operator conflicts with it and sometimes it doesn't. That will give us all the four patterns um, and accounting for the variation. So then this is my summary. Um, I've been talking about universals and variations. Um, in the behavior of logophoric pronouns. Um, and um, it's a mixture of the two factors. On the one hand, we have the universals that get at the deep nature of the building blocks of language, in particular, the variable reference distinction. On the other hand, we have parameterized features on the morphosyntactic surface, um, whether something's plus L or unmarked for L. Both factors are at work in the operator binding of the pronoun. Earlier on, I also, so that's all about the relationship between this and this. Earlier on, I also talked about um, this relationship of um, thematic control um, and the question of whether this is licensed by particular complementizers or not. Um, here, there's no known variation, um, but there's not a lot of data either. Okay, so that's what I came to say. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you for the great talk about logo, logophoric pronouns. <laughs> so, uh, yes? I'm trying to avoid accidentally sharing again. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> so, 
anybody who have uh, 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 anybody who has a question or comments and Jason's video is on perhaps Jason has one but like <laughs> it doesn't have to be <laughs> yeah I, I did have a question it's unfortunately not a deeply interesting one because uh, there's so much in there, Mark, and it's uh, so well laid out and, and compelling that just keeping up with it all took a lot of energy. But um, I, I think I want to ask a question about the something that you didn't talk about, which is the control relation between the agent experiencer like thing and the operator. Um, Typically, we think of control as having a C command requirement. And so um, I'm curious about a case where you have a, a, a sentential subject um, and you have, a, let's say, a, a logophore somewhere in there. So something like that Okun saw logophore surprised so, someone else, where the, the object of surprise in the main clause would count as an experiencer thematically. Uh, except there's no C command between that uh, thing and the uh, the operator in spec CP. So I'm wondering in that case, is the logo for out in that particular? Yep. No, that's a lovely question and you uh, underestimated yourself. Um, and it's interesting. Um, you have to you have to be a little careful about it because like many language, like many um, languages, um, BBO does not love CPs in the in the subject position. You give them maybe you know two question marks, um, but you can do it with two question marks, um, or you can um, make it perfectly fine if you embed it in the in the subject position. So we could try um, that. That Adam insulted him, um, um, angered. A cone, and that's going to be um, a couple of question marks. And we can do the news that uh, he is guilty upset a cone, and that one's going to be perfectly fine. And in both cases, we ask can the him in the subject be a logo for antecedent by the experiencer object? The answer is yes. Mm. And then we ask, is that an analogy or disanalogy with control? Here's where I differ from your synopsis. I say that's an analogy uh, because you do get control in English in similar environments. If you say something like um, losing his money upset a cone or upset John, that's pro losing his money upset John with uh, John controlling the pro. And Eden Landau shows that in the case of experiencer objects, that's even uh, that's even obligatory control. It's not non-obligatory mm. control. Mm -hmm. So it's a it's a it's a good question. That's the data. And I claim that's an analogy to control in English, not a disanalogy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's cool. Thank you. Uh... Do we have other questions? Oh, yes, Mike. Um, uh, for those, um, I, I'm not up on the recent um, uh, stuff on control, but for those that always, it strikes me that the, um, the, the clausal subject is generated beneath the experiencer object. Um, and then if you establish a control relation at that stage, then it yep. shouldn't be a problem. Yep. Uh, Yes, I think that's probably the right analysis. Um, you know, so Landau talks about obligatory control happening only in complement clauses, not in subjects and adjuncts. Mm -hmm. This is an exception where a subject does have obligatory control. Um, and we, um, we domesticate that, we unify that if exactly as Michael says that that subject starts out as an object, when it's an object, it can undergo the control. Um, and then it can undergo uh, an NP type movement to the surface subject position. Mm -hmm. And the prediction then is there would be a difference here between um, a psych object, uh, like um, that such and such happened, upset John um, and that such and such happened made John famous. Mm -hmm. yeah. Japanese literature shows contrasts between those mm -hmm. two. 
Um, do I, did I check that in a BBO? I actually don't remember 100% whether I checked the, the made famous case as opposed to the psych case. I hope I did, but I'm not 100% <laughs> sure that I did. I should say I did, and you'll never catch me. <laughs> oh, thank you. And do we have maybe, Yusha Sensei, do you have any question, perhaps? Suddenly putting thank him you. on the spot. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Hi. Uh, Thank you very much for a very, very interesting talk. And uh, I was thinking about Japanese uh, data as well. And uh, many cases, uh, things overlap. And, um, but the, the, as you said, that Japanese is probably a different, dif different kind of uh, uh, yeah. Uh, language. Yeah. yeah. I, I was curious though, because you said it, uh, how, how does that um, uh, weak crossover uh, work. Yeah. Um, I could give a long answer to that, or I could give a uh, short answer to that. Oh, let me make a remark about Japanese um, for uh, just a moment first. That um, that um, I'm working on Japanese uh, with a talented student of mine, um, Shiori. Ikawa, who will be taking up a job in Japan um, next April. Um, and we're trying to compare these two more systematic. There's been a lot of loose talk about um, and uh, about like, things like jibun in Japanese being logophoric. Um, and we're trying to see how close is the analogy really. And the other thing, it seems to be very close when jibun is inside a complement clause. Um, and it's not close at all when jibun is in a relative clause or an adjunct clause, the so-called empathic um, uses of, of jibun. Um, and we're optimistic that we can say something about that in those cases. So, so when um, Ibibio Emo and Japanese jibun are both used in complement clauses, they're very similar. Um, when jibun is used in other contexts, it has a different behavior and emo is just out. So I think what we wanna say is that uh, in both cases, there's an operator there that binds the pronoun. That's a similarity. In both cases, if it's in a, in a complement clause, it undergoes obligatory control. That's a similarity. Um, but then when obligatory control isn't possible structurally, um, the BBO is ungrammatical. And the Japanese one does something else, does a kind of non-obligatory control, which is maybe just discourse reference. So I think there's an interesting partial unification there that might happen. I guess I felt more like answering your non-question than your question. Um, your question was, what about weak crossover? Um, the answer is, if you look at the weak crossover example, that, that I gave you examples where the plain pronoun doesn't see command the, um, the, the, um, the, the logophoric pronoun in a BBO. Um, and um, I gave those as one question mark. The interest, something interesting happens though, if you put a quantifier in the matrix clause, then those one question mark examples become star. I think that's the weak crossover um, um, situation that if the antecedent is quantified, then you get the weak crossover uh, invoked, um, but otherwise it's like a weakest crossover kind of case. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the reason, part of the reason why I didn't do that is Jason was having a hard enough time following the talk already, plenty of stuff in it. Sorry, Jason. Um, but uh, just, you know, for simplicity. But also, I don't have the fact for Yorba. I should get the fact from Yorba. Yorba was the other one that allowed the two pronouns to be possible if there wasn't C command. If it's really all we cross over, then that should also become bad when you put the quantifier in the antecedent as a quantifier rather than the other. But I, I don't have that data. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, so uh, if you have any uh, questions or comments, please uh, formulate it <laughs> during the closing remark. And then we will have just a few more minutes to uh, uh, anyone who wants to have some final question. Uh, this is uh, for the record. I would like to uh, thank uh, uh, the two co-organizers, Professor Tomoyuki Yoshida and Professor Yoko Mista, the System Paris Fleming, Shigeto Kamano, as well as Liaison IELTS Institute of System Missionary Suzuki. This event was supported by shared uh, budget of ICU Research Institutes, Institute of uh, Educational Research and Service, and the Linguistic Lab at International Christian University. Uh, the next two talks will be uh, phonology. Sharon Rose and Laura Downing will uh, share their research in early December. And uh, you will get uh, notification and information about this. If you have time, please join us then. And uh, let's uh, thank uh, Mark and uh, Jason one more time uh, for their wonderful talk uh, and uh, uh, interesting data and uh, analysis. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Let's stop the recording. Yeah.